coming last um, imposes certain onus on me or some obligations on me. Um, I've got to avoid a whimper, um, a, a, a buffetic conclusion to the uh, splendid previous occasion, particularly uh, having to follow three plenary lectures of such quality. Um, Well, that's it, in a sense. I'd just like to, before I begin, um, say a little word, at least I can say about myself. Um, I spent 40 years, I'm still there, um, as a professor at Smith's own university, University of Glasgow. So I've got that sort of linkage. Um, I'm, a, I'm here representing, in a sense, Smith's homeland and his alma mater in a, in a very bad way, no doubt. Um, when Smith, at the end of his life, uh, Smith got a letter, an invitation to become the rector uh, of the university. And the rector is an official, formal position. Uh, and Smith re replied and said that his time in Glasgow University uh, was the most enjoyable and most, as it were, professional uh, time of his life. And I sort of want to echo those sentiments. And as a final sort of autobiographical note, if I may, if imposed upon you. Um, I have one link with Smith, other than the fact that I taught in the same university as him, uh, is that um, I'm proud to be a, an elected fellow uh, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, of which Adam Smith was a founder member. So I have a legacy which is part of that sort of continuity. Anyway, basta, basta. Uh, my paper. Um, stronger than a rope of sand, there should be a question mark. I forgot when I sent the thing in, there should be a question mark. Stronger than a rope of sand, uh, the problem of cohesion. Uh, I hope this mic works. I'll try not to knock it over uh, as I do my flamboyant uh, performance. Um, my title derives from John Brown's immensely popular An Estimate of the Manners and Principles of the Times of 1757. As part of his vehement critique, of contemporary society, Brown declaimed that a chain of self-interest is indeed no better than a rope of sand. There is no cement, no cohesion between the parts. And that's the text for my sermon uh, that follows. None of the writers of the Scottish Enlightenment fully endorse Brown's critique. Some of them, it is true, on occasion come close. There are, for example, passages in Keynes' sketches, um, particularly the sketch on patriotism, um, which exhibit similar sentiments. Others develop a more sophisticated uh, development of uh, Brown's position, um, and one thinks here of Adam Ferguson's essay on history of society, the last two books particularly, uh, where he talks about, and laments to some extent, um, the atomism uh, that characterizes commercial society and passivity that goes with that. Yet even Keynes and Ferguson, in them for the thought, there's a recognition of the superiority of the commercial society to anything that would embody Brown's vision. And inherent in that recognition is acknowledgement that self-interest is an ineluctable feature of society, where in Smith's phrase, which I'll quote several times here, Every man is in some measure a merchant. Given their acceptance of this, the Scots need to rebut Brown's argument and hold that a commercial society exhibits or establishes some cohesive principles that are more robust than a rope of sand. I will, in what follows, and given the circumstances of this lecture and this audience, focus on Smith, though I'll throw, throw a bit of you in, as a lot of people have been doing at this conference, I'll throw a bit of you in uh, as I go along. Uh, for a good part of this lecture, I will proceed dialogically, inasmuch as I will raise questions from what I call a Brownian point of view and assemble, assemble being an appropriate verb here, I'll assemble a Smithian um, answer. And of course this is fictive. Neither Hume nor Smith deign to discuss Brown in their published writings. There's a rather typical Humean side remark in one of his letters. And, Hume is disdainful mold, you know, saying that what he knows about Brown, he was a, a, a follower of the person who Hume detested above all others, Bishop Warburton, um, and so I've no time for this guy. Uh, 
So this is why it's a fictive exercise. It's a sort of exercise in dialogue between positions rather than a historical recreation of what people might themselves have thought. And I divide this into six parts just to give you some sort of structure uh, to what I'm going to say. So part one, uh, and I start with a, a gross-grained scene setting. Uh, gross-grained is a rather polite way of saying this is a travesty about what you're going to get. In order to be successful in their task, the Scots have to deflect or reject the Hobbesian answer to how self-interest and social cohesion can be reconciled. For Hobbes, the fact about humans is that they are concerned with their own well-being to the exclusion of others. It was not Hobbes' account of motivation that was a problem. Smith is clear that humans pursue pleasure and avoid pain. The objection was to Hobbes' insistence on exclusivity. Other individuals were either actual or potential competitors. And his solution to that unbridled competition, whether for resources or for the positional good of glory or because of lack of trust, was to establish an authorized sovereign who can enforce unequivocal definitions of good and evil. This has to be enforced because, as Hobbes put it, covenants without the sword are mere words. Individuals have to be, quote, terrorized by sovereign power to do as they would be done by. Contemporaries and successors read this to mean that morality meant no more than coerced compliance to a sovereign's edict. Many critics of Hobbes, like Samuel Clarke, took the rationalist road, but another route was traveled by the third Earl of Shaftesbury. Shaftesbury thought Hobbes' philosophy rested on a faulty reading of human nature. Humans were not irreducibly or exclusively self-centered. They also possessed what he called a natural moral sense. This language was taken up by the Scots, but their debt to Shaftesbury was mediated by the impact of Mandeville. Like Hobbes, but more insidiously, Mandeville argued that the virtuous actions, virtuous actions were not necessary to produce beneficial outcomes. Vices can have the same effect. For example, pride and luxury, Brown's bête noir, encourage industry. Mandeville was thought by his contemporaries to be claiming that virtue was a sham, that those who claimed to be virtuous, or right-thinking individuals, of course, were hypocrites. But what was so potentially damaging was Mandeville's claim that Shaftesbury's theory was untrue, because inconsistent with human experience. Now, preeminent among the defenders of Shaftesbury against Mandeville was Francis Hutchison. Hutchison effectively turned the tables on Mandeville. It was Mandeville's account that was untrue to human experience. And giving evidence that he was Hutchison's pupil, Smith expresses this in the opening sentence of the Moral Sentiments. As if I've not heard this sentence in this conference, I will actually quote a sentence very familiar to you. How selfish soever a man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derive nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. And that's very like an opening sentence of Hutchison's Inquiry. Uh, or the second inquiry, I think. Of itself, though, this declaration of Smith, his opening clarion call in moral sentiments, is not going to satisfy Brown. Since, for one thing, it says nothing about the relative weightings of the principles. And while for Hutchison, self-love presupposes moral conduct, or is a subset of benevolence, Smith and Hume recognize it as an independent presence. They do not, cannot, consistently wish it away. To meet the Brownian challenge by, on the one hand, judging Hutchison's answer as inadequate, while on the other, rejecting the posture of Hobbes and Mandeville, requires more argument. So that's the scene setting. So part two, I begin to elaborate. Smith openly declares that each individual, whether in commercial society or not, has a natural preference for his own happiness above that of other people. Although this preference is a matter of fact, it does not exist in isolation. The effect of sociality needs to be taken into account. Both Smith and Hume use the imagery of society as a mirror. It reflects back to us the effects of our actions. For Smith, it is a weakness of the Hobbesian-Mandevillian view 
but it cannot take on board the fact that the interactions of social life humble the arrogance of self-love. And this socially induced humility restrains the selfish and supports the benevolent affections. This restraint, as well as this support, is most effectively exhibited in modern commercial societies. That is, in a type of society that is the explicit target of Brown's critique. The crux of moral, Smith's moral theory is, of course, sympathy, the use of imagination by a spectator to gauge reflexively the contextual appropriateness of an actor's behavior. This sympathetic fit is neither automatic nor fixed. And one key variable is emotional proximity. Compared to the more forgiving environment of family and friends, where sympathetic concord requires less negotiation, in the relatively anonymous setting of the marketplace, more effort is needed to achieve the desired state of harmony between the actor and spectator. This extra effort has the effect of strengthening the character. In other words, the actor in a commercial society exercises a greater degree of moderation and exhibits more consistently the virtue of self-command than is possible in a more tribal and clannish time. Feckless or reckless behavior is more likely to be forgiven and tolerated among friends and family than it is with a faceless institution like a bank, especially if you want to secure a loan. Interacting with strangers instills self-discipline. Exuberant behavior in the bar among friends will be out of place on public transport. Moreover, for all the self-interestedness they embody, modern societies exhibit other virtues that mark them out as superior. A polished people, Smith says, acquire habits that make them frank, open, and sincere. In his Glasgow lectures, he observed, when the greater part of the people are merchants, they always bring probity and punctuality into fashion, so that these are the principal virtues of a commercial society. Or a social nation, in fact, is the actual word that was written down. To say they are the principal virtues is to say they will have established themselves. And since lying and lateness will not be approved, and on Smith's moral stoke social psychology, everyone desires approval, that individual actions will conform to what we can call commercial norms. And that's a common view in the Scots, not simply confined to Smith. Given that the good opinion of others is always desired, then he says, this will produce a considerable degree of virtue and irregular conduct. This conduct, principally in the form of adhering to the rules of justice, is integral to a modern society. For Smith, the reward for acting justly and being trusted is to inspire confidence in, in us from those with whom we live. As we'll emphasize later, trust and confidence are crucial because they lay a foundation for the rule-governed predictable behavior necessary to the functioning of a commercial society and which at the same time is socially cohesive. End of part two, part three. How is this more than a rope of sand? To attempt an initial answer to this, I will adapt Smith's famous example of a commercial transaction, butchers and their customers. Our transaction with butchers is payment for meat. We do not, in the normal course of events, appeal to their benevolence or humanity, but rather, says Smith, to their self-love. This, of course, is not to say the butcher cannot exercise benevolence. She may give a beggar some sausages, but that is at her discretion, whereas handing over sausages for the correct payment is not. The butcher would lose trade if she got a reputation for being untrustworthy, for supplying 10 sausages but charging for 12. The butcher's self-interest thus promotes the morality of self, morality of fair dealing. Similarly, from the customer's perspective, it pays to be a good credit risk. The bank will not lend to me if I have a record of default. The bank gains from my payment of interest on the loan, and I gain from having funds to expand my business or go on holiday. To bring out the significance of this mutuality for social cohesion, we can, in an abstract, simplified manner, identify three ways or three modes by which Adam, say, will get something he wants from Eve, say. So I'm talking about an Adam-Eve interaction, just a sort of simplified abstract model. Three modes of how Adam and Eve can interact. First, Adam can simply take what he wants from Eve. To make this the default interaction is to subscribe to the Hobbesian model, where competition, together with lack of trust, what Hobbes calls diffidence, and the need to be superior, 
produces, as he famously says, no industry, and therefore a short, miserable, brutish existence. And because this is the natural condition of mankind, then Eve is equally motivated to take back what Adam has already taken from her. But even if Hobbes' own solution is implemented, it does not remove societal instability. His argument is that what prevents Adam from taking what he wants is fear of punishment from the sovereign, the artificial person, Leviathan, created by mutual covenant between Adam, Eve, and everybody else. But Smith and the other Scots, as we've already seen, reject this argument because it rests on a faulty reading of human nature. And I'll return to human nature uh, at the end of this. Contra Hobbes, society is not held together through fear. As Hume argues, all governments rest on opinion, and he explicitly says that fear is only a secondary principle, although, of course, it has a role to play. While Smith, for his part, judges that in contrast to management, in contrast, management of persuasion is better than force and violence as a way to conduct government. Hobbesian society is always liable to instability or lack of cohesion as an enforced social order, is always vulnerable to internal dissolution through the exercise of the residual natural right of self-preservation. Second mode. Adam can receive what he wants or needs as a gift from Eve. Like Eve, you do a good deed when through an act of beneficence you make others happy by presenting them with something they want or which you know they will, in which you know they will take delight. Equally, giving to charity to support those in need is on an everyday level, or on the unreflective course of common life, a morally good action. The practice of benevolent gift-giving, or Christian charity, would seem to be the model that underlied Brown's own prescriptions. However, this is also unstable. It, too, can be a rope that cannot bear much weight. The reason for this is its discretionary element. In the standard jurisprudential language of Smith's era, Benevolence is an imperfect obligation because it cannot be externally compelled. And even if it's accepted with Brown that one ought to be benevolent or heed one's Christian duty, it does not have a sufficiently cohesive force in a commercial society. Well, so much the worse for a commercial society, Brown might say. But the Smithian point is not that individuals cannot, should not act morally and follow their conscience, but that this action cannot be reliably generalized as a societally foundational principle. As starkly put by Smith, and we've heard this quotation before, uh, society cannot subsist without beneficence, sorry, I'm going around, can subsist without beneficence but not without justice. From which it follows that a Brownian society, if based solely on beneficence, can hardly be cohesive. Its very existence is parasitic upon the foundational security of justice. It is because justice is not discretionary or arbitrary that it functions as a socially cohesive force, to, or cement, to use Brown's other image from my text for this sermon. While everyone can agree unjust acts should be punished, that agreement is lacking when the issue is who deserves to be the subject of beneficence, cancer patients or the homeless, say. It's so on this basis that Hume criticizes natural morality for potentially exacerbating rather than resolving social disagreements, and Smith objects to accounts of justice that go beyond his own strict understanding. I will, though, return to the obverse of this, whether the necessary condition of justice is a sufficient condition for social cohesiveness. Third mode. Adam can engage Eve in barter or exchange. Suppose Adam has two knives and no forks, Eve has two forks and no knives. As it happens, both Adam and Eve want a knife and a fork. Following their own self-interest, they can thus trade and both get what they want. Nothing in this transaction relies on Adam and Eve knowing each other. It thus comports with what Smith calls an assembly of strangers, or the prevailing circumstances of life in a commercial society, as we might now say an Amazonian, an Amazonian society. What it does rely on is the predictable force of self-interest. Unlike the first mode of interaction, the Hobbesian one, does not depend on the threat of external sanction to prevent Adam simply seizing one of Eve's forks. Unlike the second mode, 
does not depend on discretion. Eve could give Adam one of her two forks, even though he has only one knife, but then again, she may not. However, if Adam has something Eve wants in exchange, then both have a reason to do business, and scaled up, this mutuality provides a cohesive social cement. Nonetheless, the Brownian could still reasonably object to the exchange model. It too embodies contingency. If one party has nothing to exchange, then because self-interest is the motive, it will not occur, and that possibility undermines this model of cohesion. The rope of sand survives. Okay, part four. What's the Smithian response to this objection? Uh, one way, the easy way possibly, uh, is to reaffirm his denial that self-interest is an exclusionary principle. Humans act on other principles, and these, via the mirror, support cohesion. But I want to bracket that reply and instead take more fully on board that specific objection to commercial society. To, that, to do that means grappling more fundamentally with what a commercial society entails. A society where every man is in some sense a merchant is a society of interdependence. This interdependence is a necessary consequence of the division of labor, and the extent of the division of labor and thence of societal wealth depends on the extent of the market, and that depends on having confidence in the future. Similarly put, Adam will manufacture knives to sell, and Eve will manufacture also forks to sell, but they will specialize in that way only if they are confident that on market day, Adam can sell knives and buy forks, and the same applies to Eve, reciprocally. Without that confidence, then their self-interest would lead Adam and Eve to manufacture both knives and forks. But with the effort now spread, there'll be fewer knives and forks. Moreover, those that are made will be inferior to those could have been made by specialization. And when scaled up, this interdependence becomes a commercial society, hence the famous image of the coat in the early chapters of The Wealth of Nations. And it is this society that involves, sorry, this society that removes miserable poverty and improves the well-being of all. Everyone is better fed, clothed, and housed than in any society that would take seriously Brown's or indeed Rousseau's prescriptions. In addition, with the greater social wealth, then the virtues of charity and benevolence are better performed in civilized and thriving nations. If these virtues are seen with Brown as inducing cohesion, then on those grounds, commercial society is cohesive. And while the modern form of society rests upon reliability, there must, of course, be institutional support, and this comes in the form of the rule of law. The effect of that is to establish the requisite certainty and predictability. Without those, then the division of labor and market would not be viable. And this, of course, is the crucial argument from the wealth of nations. Of course, enforcement is necessary, but this is not a reprise of Hobbes. For him, everyone attempts to free ride because the default interaction is zero sum. The decisive advantage of a society based on exchange is that it is non-zero sum. Both Adam and Eve get knives and forks. Why won't commercial actors free ride as a matter of course? The answer lies in the mutually supportive effects of trust. And this lies at the heart of the cohesiveness of modern societies and why they are held together by more than a rope of sand. Well, how does this work? For Smith, as for Hume, justice is pivotal. And though in Smith's case it is a natural root in resentment, it is a product of experience. We learn to be just. The rules of justice are taught through the media of discipline, education, and example. By being exposed to this range of instruction, which is in effect the process of socialization, then so scarcely without exception, everyone can live what are in practice decent, blameless lives. Social living does not require the superhuman qualities possessed by saints or heroes. What enables individu individuals, the coarse clay of mankind, in Smith's phrase, to live more or less peaceably together is that thanks to this common instruction, they share a sense of justice. This sentimental agreement induces trust and sufficient confidence that the conduct of others can be relied upon. We can add that this Smithian account, also we found in Hume, fits some contemporary analysis. For example, Eleanor Ostrom's version 
as humans learn to trust one another, they develop reciprocity norms. And she further draws attention to the fact that when many individuals act reciprocally, then there's an incentive to acquire a reputation for keeping promises and performing actions with short-term costs but long-term benefits. Even free riders, like Hume's sensible knave, will, as he puts it, suffer a total loss of reputation and the forfeiture of all future trust and confidence with mankind. To which Smith would add, this forfeiture would, even in the knave, putatively, be painful, since it's true of all humans that they possessed an original aversion to offending others. This aversion and the socially induced interpersonal confidence identified by Smith needs, as he appreciates, as I've already noted, to be reinforced institutionally. So by living under the rule of law, that individuals have confidence in the faith of contracts and payment of debts. It is only in commercial society, he says in TMS, that the authority of the law is perfectly sufficient to protect the meanest man in the state. The great advantage of modern times, as he says this time in the rhetoric, is the greater security that comes from separating justice from politics, which I think was uh, Barry Winecast, source of his paper earlier this morning. Again, it is the modernity that is crucial. It is with the introduction of commerce and manufactures that order and good government, and with them the liberty and security of individuals is found. And this is in pointed contrast to the servile dependency of, and localized warfare of pre-commercial times. Contrary to Brown's tireless condemnation of the enervating and effeminizing effects of luxury as the besetting sin of self-interested society, and for in consequence inter alia, undermining military capacity, commercial society is strong. As Hume argues, ages of refinement, i.e. luxury, promote industry, knowledge, and humanity as an indissoluble trio without detriment to martial valor. For Smith, professional armies are superior to citizens' militias. Moreover, any attempt to introduce them would run contrary to the dominant inclinations of the populace in modern societies. And moreover, with the need consequently for a very rigorous police to enforce participation would make the proposal even more unpalatable. In sum, the clear implication is that a society where every man lives by exchanging, operating on the assumption of self-interest, is more peaceable, more equitable, and on those solid grounds more cohesive than Brown alleges. But this still might appear too superficial and paint too rosy a picture. A number of issues could be invoked here. These include the extent to which the actual operation of commercial society saps its own integrity and thus by extension corrodes its cohesion. Leaving to one side the growth of material inequality, because that's an issue that animates neither Brown nor Smith, this corrosion could be identified in the damage done to the intellectual, social and martial virtues of the laboring poor, or in the corruption of the moral sentiments emanating from the disposition to admire riches and status over wisdom and virtue. However, these are perhaps consequential effects, and Smith proffers his own remedies. But there remain two further lines of criticism from Brown's perspective, to which I now turn. So this is now the penultimate section of the paper. First, because a commercial society rests on nothing more tangible than trust, and its cognates belief, opinion, expectation, and credit, then it seems clearly too insubstantial to support a cohesive social order. The fundamental concern was that trust was no longer anchored. It was being left to float in a sea of uncertainty. Commercial society is liquid, not solid. For Brown and many others of that era, such as Davenant and Bolingbroke, both of whom are among the few writers that Brown actually acknowledges, this world of intangibles enabled speculators and stock droppers to flourish, to sell the nation. Moreover, the abstract and belief-dependent character of a modern, of a commercial society, meant this danger was all the more insidious. Uncertainty or risk is intrinsic to commerce. Adam may not be able to sell his knives. There are no guarantees, so that maybe its cohesion is no stronger than a rope of sand. Smith acknowledges the dangers in credit, uh, but in far less apocalyptic terms than Hume, even though he's less sanguine than James Stewart or Robert Wallace. There's a tone of resignation in his treatment, but the odd phrase aside, no indication that he judges this a fatal blow. And it's not obvious why on these grounds a Brownian society is any more cohesive. The belief in providential superintendence is no more substantial 
and just as prone to the presence of outliers as the belief that humans, by and large, act predictably. Similarly, the institutional backing of the established church provides no more cement than the institutional backing of the rule of law. Nonetheless, in this last point lies the second line of criticism. And indeed, this is perhaps the basic flaw that Brown, or Brownian, would detect. In the moral sentiments, in the context of underlining the indispensability of justice, Smith gives the example of society of merchants. This might just mean intra-trade association, but since he defines a commercial society uh, where everyone is a merchant to some degree, then a broader reference is warranted. And Smith chose this example, of course, quite deliberately to identify a society where mutual love and affection are absent. Those sentiments are not essential since buyers and sellers can coexist without any emotional attachments between them. They interact as self-interested individuals for the self-limited purpose of exchanging knives and forks. But the Brownian question is, does this lack of attachment corrode social cohesion? Smith, of course, is not oblivious to this issue. Indeed, in this same passage, he concedes that this society where love is absent is not very appealing. And in the immediately preceding paragraph, he says, society flourishes when its members are bound together by the agreeable bands of love and affection. The context here, though, is the fact that humans are not self-sufficient. But as we've seen with the butcher, beneficence does not support a solid society-wide base. And the same qualification applies to another of Smith's statements. It's in the nature of humans, he says, to love their own country, the extent to which they judge it superior to others even of the same kind, i.e. the French. But this alertness on Smith's part to a patriotic love of one's country also does not mark him, does not mark a radical departure from the argument. This is apparent from his remarks a few paragraphs later, and there he states, and I'll now give us a slightly longer quotation now than the paraphrasing I've been doing so far. He is not a citizen who is not disposed. Typical Smith is double negative. He is not a citizen who is not disposed to respect the laws and to obey the civil magistrate. And he is certainly not a good citizen who does not wish to promote the welfare of the whole society of his fellow citizens. In peaceable and quiet times, he goes on, these two principles coincide. The support of the established government seems evidently the best expedient for maintaining the safe, respectable, and happy situation of our fellow citizens. On these tranquil times, peaceful and quiet, are as a general rule provided by a commercial society. Hence, in those circumstances, that is, those relevant to the issue at hand, acting justly and abiding by the rules, support societal well-being on a wider front. However, the Brownian may judge that this reaffirmation of the crucial role of keeping the rules and acting justly means the rope remains frayed. Sorry, it means that the rope is, remains frayed and unable to bear the weight necessary for cohesion. Oh, sorry, I garbled that sentence. The Brown can reply to this that the rope is still frayed. Keeping the rules and simply keeping the rules and acting justly, the rope is still there. Not robust at all. That is to say, for the Brownian, it remains the case that the primacy given to justice by Smith and Hume means the cohesion-inducing social preferences, to use Samuel Bowles's term, for motives that induce people to help each other, remain secondary. Similarly, the negativity of justice that facilitates the commercial actor's wish to be left alone to get on with their own affairs produces the neglect or crowding out of public service and the dissolution of social cement. Accordingly, the Brownian could push the critique further. Social preferences, rather than being secondary, are themselves essential. Indeed, somewhat in the way that Hume criticized contractarianism, or as Herbert Hart argued some 50 or so years ago, the butcher's obligation to give the correct number of sausages to a customer assumes some pre-existent rule of just conduct. And that cannot itself be grounded in an obligation to follow rules. You can't meaningfully make a promise to keep promises. In an implicit response, Smith does state that individuals, in fact, will do more than merely follow the rules of justice. They will also revere them. He even goes as far as to say that without this reverence or sacred regard to the rules, human society would crumble into nothing because without it, mutual conduct could not be depended upon. Whence this reverence? Smith gives what I judge to be his standard answer 
It is the effect of habit, our continual observations on the conduct of others, which are then internalized. I think Smith thinks this is robust enough. Brown presumably would not. He would hold to the case in Smith's own language that the important rules of morality are the commands and laws of the deity. This statement Smith explicitly calls an opinion and one which enhances habitual reverence. And I take this to mean it is not of itself the source of reverence. Nonetheless, this opinion of deity does have an origin in nature, that is, in human nature, and it's characteristic, he says, of the ignorance and darkness of pagan superstition, albeit is later confirmed by philosophical researches. What is confirmed, I would argue, is the opinion that humans ubiquitously ubiquitously hope that obedience to divine laws will be rewarded and disobedience punished in the life to come. By saying that this ubiquity is anchored in human nature brings me to my final point. In the moral sentiments, Smith distinguishes between concord and unison. Whereas a concord is a negotiation between actors and spectators that the social mirror reflects and which produces social harmony, that is cohesion, unison is undifferentiated. Smithian commercial society is one based on concord, while that envisaged or advocated by Brown is one based on unison in the sense of embodying uniformity. The latter is not morally appealing. It belies the principles of natural liberty, according to which, as you all know, as long as we follow the laws of justice, individuals will be left perfectly free to get on, to go with it, as Vieri was saying, make a go of it. As Smith says, symptomatically of sumptuary legislation, it is a monstrous impertinence for the government to determine what clothes I can wear. Yet, this legislation, sumptuary legislation, encapsulates the, what social unison, i.e. uniforms, produces in practice. The concord established in commercial society is for Smith more robust than a rope of sand. That strength or resilience is not fatally dissipated by the presence of negative effects or aspects in a commercial society such as the growth of debt or mentally stultifying labor. It is the presence of self-interest, together with its consequences, that is the very factors that Brown sees as the weakness of commercial society, that is its, at the core of its strength. Ultimately, this is because it is a constant and universal principle of human nature, trucking and barting and so on. Yet, any recourse to human nature is of course not going to be definitive. And to illustrate this, I return to a Brownian objection that an exchange society embodies contingency, but as it appears in the very different guise of Karl Marx. In his 1843-1844 writings, especially in his commentary on James Mill, Marx invokes need as a principle of true communal nature, human, true human communal nature, and judges the Smithian exchange model as defective. On Marx's reading of that model, both Adam and Eve see their knives and forks as an objectification of their own self-interest and not as a joint expression of human production. So if Eve has one knife and no forks, and Adam has a knife and two forks, then with nothing to exchange, Eve is impotent and stands like the beggar before the butcher in the position of a supplicant. For Marx, in the absence of private property, Eve's lack of a fork would be supplied by Adam as a fellow human. But, and this is my point here, Marx's own version is as is itself, of course, not determinative. Indeed, his own model seems to imply unison, since my expression of my human nature, my Gattungwesen, will necessarily comport with your expression. Now, there are arguably ways to adjudicate between different accounts of human nature, but I'm not going to that. Instead, two sentences in conclusion. I conclude by reiterating two points. First, in line with his reading of human nature, for Smith, commercial society produces sufficient concord for social harmony, a concord that he's shown not only to be viable, but morally superior to society predicted, predicated on unison. Brown's nostalgia for an earlier time is misplaced. And second, on that basis, and for all its vehemence, Brown's critique is misdirected and thus unjustified. Commercial society is robust, and its cohesion is stronger than a rope of sand, or to misappropriate a well-known phrase, it's more like a lump of granite. Thank you.